so thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Julia for this pairing, uh, uh, this kind of dialogue that she's uh, proposing uh, between uh, Sarab and uh, Annie's presentations because um, this um, it kind of posed a challenge to me because uh, coming uh, at this uh, symposium and this kind of uh, idea between the tension or the relationship or the dialogue between still and moving images, my background's in artists, film, and video, so I have a very kind of uh, historical kind of sociopolitical idea of a kind of a collective uh, labor around uh, film and video, artist film and video, and also a collective reception of that. So to think uh, or to position the individual rather than the collective has ki uh, kind of been an interesting challenge to me in terms of thinking about uh, the kind of two propositions or positions that yeah, both of them have kind of presented today. Um, so I want to start maybe um, by talking about uh, these two kind of, um, uh, these two relationships which are set up in the presentations. And Srab, you're talking about the uh, individual's right to their image and the protection uh, against the commercial use of the image. And Annie, uh, you're talking about this kind of tension between uh, empathy and abstraction. Um, and I was, while I was sitting there and listening to Srab's presentation, I was thinking a little bit about the way in which uh, what, um, what autonomy or what uh, strategies are open to someone to regain control of their image or to take an image back. Um, and one thing that came to mind to me was, as I was sitting there and listening to your presentation, was the, um, the Artist Reserve Rights Transfer and Sale Agreement that Seth Siegelob made for artists for when the work is resold. And I was thinking of uh, a particular case recently with the artist Katie Nolan. And Katie Nolan also came to mind today for me as an artist who's reusing or appropriating uh, or the material of her work largely or quite often is uh, press photographs. But there's been two examples uh, of two works of hers uh, that she's recently, I, I don't know what the right terminology is. She's like refuted them as work. So she said that was a work by me, but it's not a work by me anymore. I, I, I can't say disown because she didn't own the works any longer, but she said this is no longer a work by Katie Nolan. And in one example, uh, a collector had changed or had repaired a work. Uh, and then she said, well, that's not the original work. It's not my work anymore. So there's this way in which she was kind of controlling, uh, even though she no longer owned the work or the work was in possession of a collector, she was kind of saying, she was refuting it or disowning the work in some sort of way and kind of retaining control in that way. So I was thinking about that in relation to the migrant mother in a way in which you could potentially legally or have some recourse to disown a work because, uh, or an image, or if that's possible or not. Uh, and uh, so that was one thought that was on my mind. And then connecting that uh, to Annie, to your presentation, the way in which uh, the other kind of strategy I was thinking of was reenactment. And I know when you were making this, this work or this project, you were kind of questioning whether to show the image or not. And so you have this idea around uh, a series of images that are presented before the the group uh, who are performing appear, but there's this kind of question or productive tension, I think, uh, relating to whether those are the like whether we're trying to match those images to the performers, or we're looking for a certain correlation, letting that be our guide, or we're just kind of looking at a relationship between uh, the performers in some sort of way, uh, and. Uh, thinking about uh, back to this idea of a kind of collective notion. I think, although uh, Sarab, in your presentation, you're talking about the kind of individual taking back ownership of their image. I think, Annie, like the individuality you're talking about is the kind of the problem of yourself as an individual you had negotiating these images uh, and what that means potentially. Uh, so I want to uh, maybe start by talking about 
that, um, it, like the kind of the way in which you, um, Annie, were kind of looking at the collective experience of making these images again as a way of kind of your working through these individual, uh, these uh, images rather as an individual. Do you mean the, the remaking part, like with yeah, the dancers? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, could you say the question again then? I, I, if you could talk about the way in which, uh, how you came to the, a group working through the kind of ethics and empathy of the image rather than okay. you just doing that on your own or why, why yeah. was it that particular strategy of a, of a group rather yeah. than just something that you could, I mean, the, the text you read today kind of works through some of those problems as well. Like yeah. you could have just done something that was focused more on your own body or your own voice rather than a group. Well, I think it was, um, you know, part of what attracted me to the images was the, the, the sheer physicality of them. In terms of uh, collect, collect, collective action or collectivity and the individual, the other thing I think that's really weird um, about these images is that, like I said, I was when I was looking through the images, I was looking for examples of collective action, and this is uh, one of the few uh, modes of resistance that's very much about like the individual body, you know, and these bodies are being separated off from their group of uh, fellow protesters, and it's the police that are the that are turned into the group. Mm. I think, which is like a, an interesting dynamic that the individual body is forcing the police uh, the police to act as a collective group in in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that, I mean, in your locating it, uh, this kind of uh, question in a very particular space, this particular room, and I was really, I really liked the moments in the in the video where you have uh, the individuals that are kind of moving towards the same corner of the room, and you know that's where it's going to stop, although it's kind mm -hmm. of this ghosting, so, but you know there's this kind of finite limit, limit uh, that's imposed upon it, and I was thinking about a, a quote by Craig Bordowitz where he, um, says the question is not what constitutes politics in general, but what constitutes the politics of the room that you are in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, it, getting back to that kind of collective uh, encounter, it's also um, what's at work in your particular project, I think, is a kind of collective dynamic between that you're kind of establishing between the people who are there. Like I think of something like the films of Peter Watkins where it's really about this kind of uh, relationship that's negotiated that, or that's developed or proposed between the participants rather than, I mean not, it doesn't exclude a viewership but it's kind of located in that. Like there is a kind of dialogue I imagine around this kind of empathy or abstraction about the images when you're making them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I didn't want it to end up being something that was too closed off within the group of the performers. That's why, you know, in this question of whether to include the original images or not, that's why in the end I decided to include them. So this this uh, excerpt of the images going up on my studio wall, um, it's going to be on a monitor in the same space. Mm. So it's sort of like there, but not there. I, I just didn't want it to be um, too much of a sort of like uh, private exercise that they were involved in that didn't provide any access to the audience to understand what they were engaging in. You know, I didn't want it to be like a collective action that was um, cut off from the rest of the world. And Sarab, in, in kind of in relationship to your presentation, I found it was really interesting kind of with Annie's locating it in a real physical space and then this kind of question of the image which I mean as you're addressing is so dematerialized now it's like you can't it's or it's difficult to locate the I mean in your uh, text that your uh, presentation is based on you're very carefully uh, kind of uh, inscribe or kind of address photography still within a material construct and you're very uh, and it would be wrong in a way to say it's dematerialized, but the proliferation or the circulation, I guess, dispersion of images, uh, the way in which then how can they be restricted or how can you locate uh, an original when there's so many different places? Like how can you control that original image when it is so dispersed in a way? Um, I was wondering if you could maybe address that a little bit in terms of uh, yeah, just the way in which it's, I mean, because a lot of the, like, the historical examples you're giving, uh, like the Dorothea Lang, like, it, it had a kind of uh, circulation within, like, uh, a photojournalistic context and an uh, art historical context uh, through the Family of Man exhibition, for example. Well, I guess 
there, there, is a, there is a few things. I mean, one is that um, it's futile, but there's an attempt to sort of uh, create this sort of relationship between the person and their image. And it seems like that relationship only becomes concrete where there's a, a certain tension with the individual and, and the legal system. So that's one thing. That, that then it becomes a, a, a sort of the, the image, which is um, taken from a person, then suddenly becomes actually the person itself. So, mm. for instance, that, that's obviously what happened in surveillance. So that's that's one tension that I think is important. The other thing I feel it was um, uh, the the sort of empathy and abstraction was actually very a sort of important title. I think that's um, that that in a way that. Um, I guess what I was trying to uh, think about was similar relationships. An abstraction uh, there is, is, is the kind of moment where maybe it's, it's the result of this proliferation, maybe it's the result of the di digital, but also maybe it's the result of the art, where we've moved from the actual idea of the photograph. I don't think a photograph exists anymore. But right now what we have is the photographic, which is a discourse, and it's really different from photograph itself. And, and that is important because then the question is, what is the relationship between the abstraction, which abstraction here is actually the photographic, uh, which has all these representational qualities, but it, it is no longer an innocent document. And, and empathy, I, I felt that was an interesting sort of addition to that because what I was trying to do is that if there is like this, let's say, common image of humanity that, 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 that sort of the ethics of photojournalism is trying to protect all the time, um, Family of Man was uh, making appeals to it, and still photojournalism is trying to make that appeal. If there is such thing, then that is also a negotiation with the abstract. And that abstract that we're talking about is, um, is, is sort of determined within the, the, the sort of um, let's say systems of representation that we have, you know, and I, I, I'm trying to say there's a back and forth between sort of a, the, the, the abstraction of the common Im image of humanity, which is sort of like this dignified idea of, of, of let's say what the police is violating in these videos, for instance, you know, and then there's the other abstraction, which is the abstraction of the image, let's say, in, in sort of financial capitalism, which I think is not unrelated to actually how we think of um, photography itself. And this relation between, the, obviously, the commodity form and, and photography is something that goes back to the industry itself. So, so I, I'm, this, this sort of like tension between these two forms of abstraction is, um, I guess, what I was interested in. And in a way that where does the, an individual stand between this negotiation and there are moments of tension that gives its um, and I want to insist that always those moments of tension are violent mm -hmm. moments. So that is where the individuality starts to happen. So here, I think actually in, in, in the video that we saw, it, again, it's, it, it, the, the, the moment of individual in the crowd, it's, it's common, it's, it's, it's like a, um, there's a group of people, obviously, there's a group dynamic that creates the individual mm -hmm. there, you know, through this tension. Right. Or, but I mean, or the individual creates the group too. Yeah, exactly. There is that sort of. It needs to happen. That confrontation happens for these characters to sort of, um, you know, the, the the relation between the self and the group or abstraction, kind of starts to materialize itself. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense. But. Yeah. No. I mean, I was also uh, just in what you were saying right now. It made me think a little bit about another kind of uh, production productive tension between. Um, related to a, a abstract, abstraction or in empathy is the tension maybe between autobiography and self-portraiture for me, um, where uh, the artist Steve Renke uh, once was told me that, I mean, the idea of like autobiography, there is like one self, you have like the time you were born and you died, but like the multiplicity of self-portraits, you can have any number of self-portraits and it can kind of verge on abstraction in terms of abstracting the self rather than getting back to like the core uh, person and part of that, I think, in terms of the the uh, the privacy that is sought, is the way in which uh, something like the migrant mother photograph kind of then redraws the autobiography of the person. That it's 
the, the image, there's a point in which they, were, they had this kind of single autobiography. The image happens and then it splits into multiple ones. There's like the, the person's private life that continued. There's this kind of way in which it was discussed by art historians, academics, et cetera, et cetera. There's this way in which the, it becomes like a prism somehow that it kind of splits it. And you could think of the, the I mean, the, the image itself is a portrait, but not a self-portrait, not one that you'd have control control over necessarily. So I was thinking about that. I mean, I was also thinking about um, this kind of uh, the relationship between publicity and privacy that you're talking about in your presentation and this idea of privacy to, I was thinking about that in relation to solitude or what, how we would kind of frame privacy in a kind of contemporary context. Um, because I was talking to uh, a few different colleagues um, uh, about the the book that uh, Sarah Lara Grauer wrote about uh, dropout piece by uh, yeah. Lilzano, um that work by her and so thinking about that like this idea of uh, withdrawal is so um, I mean it's like a, an art historical narrative but I think it's also uh, a kind of political narrative now in relation to the way in which yeah we retain control over an image is it to withdraw from social media is that a way to control your image more is it to withdraw from certain social circles or what what is that and then when you're withdrawing is it in search of a solitude or is it what is that i mean that's kind of something that's quite unresolved for me is that uh, yeah well I guess just to, to that, I can add that um, the, the, the importance of, of privacy is that um, it's the only, or essence we can say that the, the, the one of the things that happens from the move from the discipline to control society, and I think the control society is the end of privacy. And I think we're getting to uh, the, the end of privacy, obviously, is also related to, to surveillance but, or to proliferation of image production, all of that. And I feel there is an attempt, at least on, on the side of the artist, to create privacy. I mean, at, at least what I can say, I don't think art, artistic production, in, in a way, is one of the last resorts of privacy because um, I don't think artists produce uh, you know, there's something about, at least, I know there's like groups of artists that work together, but um, they produce in, 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 in sort of private, you know, there's, there, there's that part of it. But also I feel um, what's important, at least to me, like the, the whole sort of way that I got involved with this, um, with some of these ideas was the early experiments of artists with cameras that now is that what we're seeing right now with digital. I mean, like you can say like how Vito Conchi used to like throw the camera around, you know, and now those images have become so common of like, let's say someone running around in Tahrir Square, you know, it's, it's because they, the media is now makes that possible. But also like something that the country would, would do, and it's, uh, it's strange that I refer to him, but, it, but it's that he also did go through that very moment of, of this boundary between privacy and publicity. You know, like in, um, you can think about the, the piece that he's, um, masturbating in the gallery, you know, there's like, he really put the camera right at that very moment where this sort of, what you're saying, this sort of like, the prism is starting to happen. With re regards to Dr. Long, I think that's also important because that's a different, um, that's a different moment in a way that both circulates these ideas, but eventually you, you have to have, you, you know, it takes, takes time, but eventually the individual is recognized, you know, mm. in, in the art historical context. Because before that, I mean, obviously the individual existed, but it has to go through all of these loops or hoops for a moment to finally acknowledge that this is a portrait of a person, you know, rather than just a portrait that represents, let's say, migration. I don't know if that makes sense, you know? Uh. Oh, how are we doing for time? Were there any questions from the audience? Yeah, is there, I don't know, is there a mic for? I don't think so. Oh yes, okay. Um, I think the migrant mother is a really, really interesting place to have a discussion about the role of the photographer or the artist. I don't think even Dorothea Lang at that time might have even considered herself an artist. Mm -hmm. um, she was working for a government agency, as you know, 
and there were a team of photographers, I think there were about eight of them. They took thousands of pictures and they were hired by uh, a government, uh, they were hired by Paul Taylor, who was a sociologist who ended up being her husband at one point actually, um, later. Um, but they were working together to change public policy. And those photographs were created um, not for the public, they were created to show the government what was happening in the country um, so that social funds could be released for these people. Mm -hmm. And they had an incredible role and they actually did change public policy. I think what's tricky is images become unleashed from their origins and they get co-opted and you know, reappropriated and positioned differently. You know, this woman in the migrant mother picture is not the only person who wasn't identified. There were thousands of people. So I think the tricky part is how do we balance the need for this kind of social documentation to actually change public policy and the rights of the individual? It's a really, really tricky position. And I think I get, I get really sensitive about this idea that somehow you know, Dorothea Lang was out to exploit people and make money off of them because that's certainly not what she did at all. Um, she was on the road for months and they were, you know, these people worked themselves to death to get these photographs. So I, I'd, I'd like to, to complicate the discussion around the role of the artist and especially in, in when they have a, a political role, like, mm -hmm. you know, to actually change things. Yeah, I mean, I actually don't think that Dorothy Long was exploiting the migrant mother. That's um, definitely not the point that I'm trying to make. But um, it is also important that that photograph was actually published in the newspaper maybe like two days later. And um, they, it's also important what you know, the FSA actually did pay the artists. So the artists were not um, sort of selling their, their images to any photo agency. They, they were on salary and that was a way to employ artists during the depression. Um, but there, and, and Dorothy Long definitely, I, I mean there's a, the way that she got to that um, farm town in, in California is really important and she, she obviously was traveling and taking these photographs. Um, and it did, uh, what's also important is that that photograph after it was published um, as you mentioned, aid, um, they, um, they sent food and other forms of help to that very camp that um, Florence Thompson was, um, I mean she had already left, but they started to um, send help and aid to, to the uh, migrants there. Um, so yeah, I mean, maybe there's a misunderstanding, but I'm not claiming that Dorothy Long, uh, she was the person was exploiting. But what is important is that there needs to be a case for both um, privacy and publicity to go hand in hand. And I think that's what I was trying to locate this whole discussion about, because as you say, it's actually not as um, as, as simple as uh, you know the the, the, the photojournalist exploiting the subject. But, uh, but there is a case for the fact that photojournalism is an industry and it is surviving because it is an industry. And we need to think about, especially now that we, we are living in the age of global media, how to think about these um, forms of representation. And not only in terms of like moments of conflict, but in the fact, but the, the, the truth is we are all under sur surveillance at all times. And how do we, as individuals, negotiate this relation with cameras? I mean, the, the sort of idea that Benjamin talks about, let's say, the, the illiterate of the future is, is not the person who doesn't know how to read or write, but it's the person who does not about, know about photography. And we have reached that moment. Um, people on boats, uh, they're all with cameras, and all of us are with cameras. So I, th I think there's a, and what I'm trying to get to is that there, we have reached a moment that we really need to figure out how we're dealing with photographs, both as individuals and as collectives. Yep. Other questions? Yeah, and th there's two in the front. There's Be Betty and Carolyn. There's a microphone there. Here. Thank you. Um, I, I'm reacting, I think, around uh, what you were saying about the photographic and the photograph being dead. Um, and also the camera, it's actually how people use the camera is actually the issue, the camera itself. 
I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's changed much. But I think uh, just to extend upon what Sarah was saying, I wanted to ask about social action a little bit, and um, sort of the history of it, in the sense that when you do uh, nonviolent action, you actually do do exercises around it. Uh, it's been a process, particularly from the civil rights movement onward. Uh, one of the issues, and I, I think that I'm really interested in, is the use of the body. And I was questioning and thinking about it's actually whose body it is. Because different actions by police around the world, depending on if it's women or if it's uh, indigenous peoples or if it's uh, people of color, who actually is protesting. And I just wanted to know if you had explored other than beyond just the performance of the action, but actually um, looking at uh, documentary uh, of protests and, and what you learned from that in the sense of how the body is actually um, used as a, as a position of resistance or of action. I was curious about that. Um, I read a lot of the sort of like um, exercises that you're talking about where, um, you know, prospective uh, resistors are trained in how to use their body effectively. And I think it's also important to state that this isn't the only way to passively resist. There's a whole range of different ways and, um, you know, you can, do some, you can do this sort of like total stoppage with your body, um, but you can also sing. In, you can march, you can um, engage in political theater in the streets or like mock elections. There's all different kinds of ways that you can um, act nonviolently. Um, I just think for me what was what was most interesting about this was the fact that it, the, the combination I think of this idea of nonviolence and of, and a very physical embodiment of nonviolence that also puts the, uh, the protester in, in such a precarious state like I, they just seem like they could um, like they're, they're just so vulnerable um, but I also agree with you that um, and this is something that as I was looking through all these images I noticed that there are differences in the ways that different people uh, can live this experience and you know it's geographical because um, it was really hard to find these images outside of the US and Canada and the UK Europe places where the police are sort of held to the standard of not, um, uh, not being violent with people that aren't, with protesters that aren't violent with them. But also I think it's, I, I could, I mean, maybe I was uh, uh, interpreting it uh, too subjectively, but it seemed to me that there were certain people that were able to be more raucous or more aggressive in their nonviolence than others, you know what I mean? Yes. Have you thought about, um, if anybody's been at a protest, I don't know if you know, but you've probably been documented. So um, you're probably in some police file somewhere because they're plain clothes policemen documenting you. So, I, But I mean, I, also now, I think there's also the power of all of, um, all of the people that are engaged in protest are also documenting. And you can see so much uh, video online of, and you're just like, you're watching the video and you're right in the middle of whatever's happening in the exchange. I mean, there's like a crazy video of the Ketelaine thing at Queen and Spadina uh, that happened um, a few years ago. So it's like, I mean, I think that this idea of um, we're being photographed all the time is true. And then also we're, everybody's photographing everybody and that changes relations within the, the protest, um, the physical protest space too. Do you think? Yes, I agree. But I do think that there, it would be interesting to, um, from the point of view of seeing how the police and who they document and why they document is yeah. a pretty interesting uh, notion. Does anybody have access to that, to those files? <laughs> um, you do. I'll just say I have my own personal experiences that um, recently on a passport clearance, I had to um, check with the police because of the use of my name. There's somebody else of my name. And so I went and checked and there were images of me on a police file, which I was ne I've never been charged with anything, of images of protests that I, uh, in Ottawa in the 90s. Whoa. So I would suggest to people that if you have been at protests, I think it's very interesting to see um, and to know this. And you don't know, um, actually. 
So even though there are other people, yes, individuals now are taking photographs, but also that changes the power dynamic, but also there's a history of this in relation to police surveillance. And I think it's also interesting the kind of difference between the images that your video begins with and this idea around uh, like cuddling what you're talking about, which happened at the G20, and now it's what's moving forward here is like a lawsuit by the people who were, uh, a class action lawsuit by the people, so it's very much a collective of people going forward who will uh, kind of uh, bring that to court, the, the, the action that happened that day against them. Mm -hmm. uh, Carolyn also had a question in front. So first of all, thank you very much for your insightful presentations. I have a question for you, um, Sorab. Um, I was wondering what you think about younger art practices, because um, you um, talked about these historical mm -hmm. um, works, and um, I think it would be interesting to hear your thoughts about works like Enjoy Poverty from Renzo Martins, or also Alfredo Jar's work. Because I think they really put the finger on what you were talking about, that there's this whole industry going on yeah. uh, with images. I think, I mean, Renzo's piece actually, for me, is a very important piece. But I think another piece that is, is important is Josh Oppenheimer's uh, work. And um, especially uh, both, uh, I mean, both of them, but um, the act of killing and then the, the follow-up, which is, I think, called the look of silence. But, um, but to your point, I mean, I think what, again, to, to, to this shift maybe from the photo, uh, photograph to the photographic, I feel like both of these, I mean, obviously Renzo's is about how the, 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 the camera's actually active and it has these roles and also that obviously contributes to that, that economy. And that, yes, that's a very important piece to me. And, 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 and it, it is a different sort of moment in a way that we think about photojournalism. And I think his concerns was obviously um, one that is thinking about photojournalism and how it functions. And in a, in a way that it obviously like feeds into this, um, this economy. Um, maybe I should talk a little bit about that piece. If, if anyone doesn't know about um, Renzo Martins, uh, Martinez enjoyed po poverty. I think it's the third in a series that never had a second film. I think, and um, and that third third one is he goes to to Congo and basically um, goes to uh, to a village and um, discusses with the people that he's uh, interacting with that um, that this whole aid system that is in place is actually uh, benefits a, the the sort of the this, the same people who are the initial exploiters or like the colonizers. Um, I mean, it's more complicated but, than that, but, the, but um, one of the devices that, um, through which this exploitation happened, he shows that is actually photojournalism itself, or let's say the industry of photojournalism, because not all, all for, photojournalists are evil, absolutely. That's not true, and I don't think he makes that claim either. Um, but, but, I, but to the point, I just wanted to say that, that um, we talked about social action and we talked about photography. And I think it's important to say that the cameras are now actually part of social action itself, um, both in a way that um, we counter document and document, and, but, it, but also in a way that, that the presence of a camera, obviously now, is something that, that creates a certain kind of action or inaction, depending on how we think of it. Um, with regards to Josh Oppenheimer's piece, I, I think that's also important because he, he decided to, to say that, well, there's no way we can have this narrative come from um, the people who were oppressed, but rather the only way to, to, to tell this story is through the people who conducted the act of killing. So then he goes and um, asks them to reenact how they did these acts of violence. And so, um, so again, that, I, th I think that's another moment of, of showing that the, um, what's happening right now is, is more, and uh, not the image, but the discursive construction of the image um, with regards to both films. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but I think that's what I could think about. Great, thank you. Actually, for purposes of time, we're gonna continue to move onwards. So hold your questions, they'll probably be useful for later on as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.